cup of God's wrath. God removes his wrath from the Jewish people. Thus said the Lord, your Lord, your God, who champions his people. Herewith I take from your hand the cup of reeling, the bowl, the cup of my wrath. You shall never drink it again. I will put it in the hands of your tormentors who have commanded you, get down, that we may walk over you, so that you made your back like the ground, like a street for passerby. That's Isaiah chapter 51, verse 22 and 23. The very next verse, chapter 52, begins the description of the righteous servant, which is completed in the entirety of chapter 53. The cup of the wrath of God did not pass to the tormentors of the Jewish people in the life of Jesus or thereafter, who said he was the man described in Isaiah 53. After the death of Jesus came the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by Rome, the dispersal of the Jewish people throughout the world, Christianity, Muhammad and Islam, the Spanish Inquisition, numerous pogroms, and the Holocaust. And God says, Nevermore shall you be called forsaken, nor shall your land be called desolate. But you shall be called a delight in her, and your land espoused. For the Lord takes delight in you, and your land shall be espoused. A spouse that can mean to be married, uh, to adopt children, basically to adopt or support any cause, belief, or way of life. Uh, synonym, synonyms, adopt, embrace, take up, take to, take to one's heart, receive enthusiastically, wholeheartedly, accept, Welcome, support. God saying the world will espouse Israel and they will know that God sanctifies Israel. So all this is for the Roman dispersal. You know, everything from chapter 51 forward to the end of Isaiah, you can find the Roman dispersal in it and these kind of references to the day of the Lord. And etc. etc. You can find the room of this person. This did not happen in the days of Jesus and thereafter, as the land lay desolate for over 2,000 years. I believe um, at least 200, uh, 2,009 years since the death of Jesus, anyway. When that's 40 years later, well, anyway, it's about 2,000 years since the Jewish revolts would be the best timeline. I, I suppose the third revolt, but it was the first revolt that they destroyed the temple. And uh, taunts of violence and hateful writings of the Jewish people abounded, such as the infamous, The Jews and Their Lies by Martin Luther. The Jewish people have returned to the land of Israel from the Roman dispersal and by their toil have made the desolate land bloom as God said it would in a time to come. The cup of God's reeling and wrath has passed to the tormentors of the Jewish people. Those who told the Jewish people to get down and walked all over them. In general, that's to all Gentiles of the world. But that's Christianity in particular who took their book and told them they don't know how to read it. And that is prophetic of their false God and tried to get the Jewish people to convert to their false God. And God returns. Who is this coming from Adam? This is right after his wrath. This isn't far. This is Isaiah 63. All this stuff's starting to go together. 
and of course culminate in Malachi 3. I mean, really, the uh, the day of the Lord, it, it, it starts with Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, we have the description. We have Jeremiah, and he's talking about, and he has uh, 31. See, a time is coming with a ruined land. Well, the land's not ruined yet in his time. Not until he gets into exile. But Rome stays on for quite some time in there. But uh, it's left in desolation. And the uh, there's, there's questions about, well, how come Christianity is always referred to as a saw of Dom? Because those are his descendants. Saw, the Edomites, and, and they're thought to be Arab, the Gentiles, and the saw intermarried right off the bat. People from Adam, he had Gentile wives. So uh, his lineal descendants are basically considered Gentiles, Edomites. And they actually, uh, Adam began east of the River Jordan, near the Sinai Peninsula and the King's Highway. Uh, and they actually became, they were a country below Judah, these Edomites. And uh, they became associated with Rome. And they even, they even assisted Rome in the revolts and are thought to have taken part in the destruction of the first temple. But in the town that they become, they become associated, Adam saw not only with Rome, but to Rome Christianity and uh, Christianity in general, Gentiles in general, Adam saw. Adam was Gentile territory. It was where it, it would lie in Jordan today. Its, it's uh, main city was Basra, as Jerusalem is to Israel. And the king of Adam, who would have been a descendant of Esau, and Esau is the twin brother of Jacob, who becomes and is renamed by God to be Israel. So, and they were always antagonists because Esau was considered the older brother. And apparently Jacob, uh, the trickster, tricked him into uh, giving him uh, his firstborn rights you know, with a big bowl of soup. He, he was a big hunter. He was... He was like a man's man, you know, and uh, not much of a thinker. So anyway, that's, uh, and uh, uh, the king of Adam would not allow the Israelites, Moses, God, God and the Spirit, to pass through it. And they eventually went around. And God returns. Who is this coming from Adam in crimson garments from Basra? Who is this majestic in attire? Pressing forward in his great might. It is I who contend victoriously, powerful to give triumph. That would be God. And that's Isaiah 63, verse 1. The overwhelming majority of the homilies about Adam speak explicitly of Rome. I'm reading for what God had me put into the book, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. It was stated that Rome was founded by the children of a son. That's just how they looked at it. The Hebrew word Adam means red. And the Hebrew Bible relates it to the name of its founder. This is Adam. Esau, the founder of Adam, the Edomites, the elder son of the Hebrew patriarch Isaac, because he was born red all over. As a young adult, he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for red pottage. The Tanakh describes the Edomites as descendants of Esau. And these identifications occurred in the Midrashim. Okay, that's the plural form of Midrash and the Talmud. But also in the Palestinian Targums and the Torah and in the Targums to Lamentations and Esther, Adam became a synonym for Christian Rome and after the fall of Rome to Christianity. The Targums are interpretive renderings of the books of the Hebrew Scriptures with the exception of Ezra, Nehemiah, 
and Daniel into Aramaic. Such versions were needed by the normal medium of communication among the Jews. They stopped speaking pure Hebrew. In synagogue services, the readings of the scriptures was followed by a translation into the Aramaic vernacular, the street talk of the populace. But eventually it became more elaborate and incorporated explanatory details inserted here and there into the translations of the Hebrew text. To make the rendering more authoritative as an interpretation, it was finally reduced to writing. Uh, that's information from Bruce Metzger on the Jewish Targums. I think I got it from the Jewish Virtual Library. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord has a sword. It is sated with blood. It is gorged with fat. The blood of lambs and he goats. The kidney fat of rams. For the Lord holds a sacrifice in Basra, a great slaughter in the land of Adam. Okay, you can find the Roman dispersal throughout Isaiah, but most definitely from chapter 51 forward. Here he is in Basra, sacrifice, he's coming from there. Now that's it, the other, now you can read 63 differently, and I'm going to get to that. Now 34 would be, if his prophet is heeded, then you're talking about vindication against the Gentiles, the Dom, Rome, Christianity. But if the prophet's not heeded, if Elijah can't get done what he's supposed to do, that means he's not being heeded. That he's not believed to be the man described in Isaiah 53. That he's not the messenger of covenants. The clear of the way for the Lord. That means he didn't get recognized. And that's picked up in 63. Now that was chapter 34. And this is what that would mean. Okay, Basra was to Adam as Jerusalem is to Israel. This is a prophetic announcement by God written by his prophet Isaiah of his wrath on Christianity. God has a sword saved with blood. Wrath. It is gored with the fat of lambs. Christianity, the sinless lamb, unblemished lamb. It is gorged with the fat of lambs. I just did that. And he goats. Okay, he goats, a clean animal for Jewish dietary laws. The shepherds of God's flock. He goats. The shepherds of God's flock. Just keep going. Okay, the kidney fat of rams. For those who believe Isaiah 53 is a guilt offering of unblemished rams who are the Jewish people in the Holocaust, such as Rabbi Singer and his followers. That may be a loose interpretation. But it definitely has to do with the guilt offering. And Gentiles. God says, I trot out a vintage alone of the peoples. It's the Jewish people. No man was with me. I trod them down in my anger. Is a destruction in the end. His vindication is coming on those who are listening to his prophet instead of Christianity. I trampled them in my rage. Their life blood bespattered my garments. And all of my clothing was stained. Remember, this is being written for the people of antiquity first. This is a reference to utter destruction to the land of Malachi 3. If the purpose of Elijah does not prosper, because the Jewish people will not recognize his prophet, and particularly the rabbis. The Lord coming from Adam is mentioned by many of the prophets in the Bible. Where does he come from anyway in the Messianic age? You know, I mean, I know Judaism doesn't know what a man of divine beings is. Do, do, you, do they assume that God is with David as he was with Moses, just right there with him? I mean, I, I've, I haven't seen anything on it. I've read several articles 
uh, from Shabbat to uh, Jewish learning, this, that. And I never see anything about God or His temple. But I'm not saying that that's not in the Talmud. It may very well be. It's just a curiosity to me. Uh, the Lord was not allowed to pass through Adam in the exit with Moses and the Jewish people. So this is an event to occur. Well, it has occurred. Or at least it will occur when we get to Israel. But God is in a Gentile company. He, he's coming from Texas. Then it's coming from Texas. This is a dumb. And I'm a descendant of the saw, a Gentile. And of the peoples, there are no Jews that are going to be with God. He's got to have a man. You don't know if God's there. And his presence has been, he tell, he's telling me on the fly here, the guiding angel, angel of his presence, Holy Spirit, that he has. His very presence has gone to Israel and to Jerusalem. But you didn't know about it, Israel and Jerusalem, because he didn't have a representation, a human being, who was described in Isaiah 53. The interpretation of this prophecy is that the prophet like Moses with God, as God was with Moses in the Exodus, will come from Adam. Now these are the words of God. That's why I sometimes, you know, uh, give you how I was taught. Okay, but then I like to sometimes repeat it exactly as God had me write it. The Christian world. The Gentile world. So, okay, I just covered all that. And the Gentile is God's righteous servant who God specifically describes for the day of the Lord. He is God's visible representation and speaker and writer of his words as Moses was. He is the prophet like Moses. God says he will put his words in the mouth and he will speak to the Jewish people all that God commands him. Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verse 18. I, this is God speaking, I will raise up a prophet for them from among their own people. That would be the Israelites, like yourself. He's talking to Moses. I will put my words in his mouth. And he will speak to them all that I command him. That's verse 18. The Spirit of God lit upon me and entered me, and God was in his Spirit. Okay, chapter 11, describing Moshiach. The twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. Okay, King David was an Israelite. I am that descendant because I'm the man the Spirit of Light and entered into. So, uh, I am of the line of Israelites. And it's weak. And by the halakha, there isn't any question I'm a Gentile. I don't know of any Jewish moms and grandma, uh, any Jewish people at all in my family line. But I can only take it back to my, really my grandparents. And I only had one set. I don't know how anybody remembers anything past that unless you studied it and your family had kept track of everybody, your ancestral tree. Which is another reason you know God wrote, for instance, Chronicles. You know, because back, <laughs> back in that time, every time somebody got pregnant and had a baby, some fellow didn't ride out to their house and start taking their ancestral history. You know, and then a baby was born to so-and-so. They didn't have, you know, and the census was most definitely frowned upon. But that's, that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about how to get into the Hebrew Bible. Because God took somebody and his spirit entered him. God was in his spirit and he said, get a stylus and paper and write this down. We're going to write a scroll of the genealogy of many of the tribes. It doesn't cover all the tribes. But uh, you can't find any Tishbites, by the way. Elijah the Tishbite. God, why does he always call him Tishbite? I can't find anything on it. Can't find a Tishbite. Well, why does he keep saying it? Since he's a Gentile. 
an inhabitant of the, the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. He appears out of nowhere in one or two Kings, chapter 17, I guess. He's all of a sudden, here he is. We don't know anything about him. We don't know about the fire refinement he may have gone through. And I would suggest he did. But we do have, we do have scripture that, uh, uh, what well, God tells us, the Spirit of God had lived upon him and God was in his spirit. It's in there. But, you know, if you don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person, which defies the imagination, there's just too much scripture. I mean, when the Spirit of God goes to Ezekiel and says, and says, speak, <laughs> or, or, or God ascends from Jerusalem and stands on a hill east of Jerusalem, descends to the hill east of Jerusalem, and then still in Jerusalem is Ezekiel, and then it says, And the Spirit of God took, Spirit of God took Ezekiel on a vision using a guiding angel, which uh, you see a guiding angel in Zechariah also. Zechariah. I'm told it's not Zech. Zechariah. 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 That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Oi. Hey, still working on that one. That's dismay. Or, whoa, whoa. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how they can really get me going and speak in, in any form. I mean, they make me sound like Tom Hanks if they want to. They've done things like that. We watch movies all the time. <laughs> and, and the Holy Spirit likes to throw out phrases and I, I gotta I gotta guess which movie it came from, but they cloud my memory. It's it's all part of the fact that God provides the information of our mind and we're always working on it. And that's just one of the ways we do it. You know, God God wants everybody to know his personality as it is not revealed in the Torah because it simply couldn't be. You know, it's a it, it, it's a personality that ranges from here to there of all humanity, in a sense. Uh, he's a, a being with uh, emotions, so is the person of the Spirit. Neither one have form or image. Okay, if there's, if there's any Son of God, and, and that term doesn't even apply to these deities, these entities, uh, uh, because they don't have a human body, they, you know. But if there was going to be a son of God, it's the Holy Spirit. You know, it's somebody just like him, no image, no form. So, neither one of which have any desire to ever be a human being. He thinks that the Spirit says, bad enough, I've had to live with him for 63 years. But uh, I think he's funny with me. I think they've had fun the whole time. I think God really likes to operate a human being, you know, and, and just take control. And I can explain this in greater detail. And when I get to Israel and get some people that I'm very comfortable with, uh, I'll tell more of these stories to them. Uh, everything from about his personality to, to all the different ways they've taught me. Uh, yeah, again, 13 years, 24-7. It never ends. Most of these videos are being put on at 2, 3, 4, 5 in the morning. Um, as I said before, I don't get to sleep much because they don't sleep. And they like fooling around. They like making me laugh. And they like to laugh. And, uh, and God likes to give people the business. He likes to test people. He just, he just likes them. You, know, you can't take his vindication and revenge from him. He wants me front and center just really putting it on the Christians because I am the true righteous servant of God. Now they're going to, you know, they're going to deny it, but they're going to they're gonna want to come, they're going to be angry. And there's nothing worse than being angry and you can't do anything about it. Because, because oh God would never put me in harm's way. I never, you know, I'm sure the Muslim eventually, especially with me talking about taking the golden dome and throwing a piece of dynamite in it, with a camera crew after we removed them from God's mount. And so they're going to hear talk like that, and they're going to say, that's it, jihad, jihad. This man has to die, every every Muslim out there, if you see him killing, this and that. I don't worry about that anymore than the man, the man. 
That guy's with me. He's in me. He's a family. He knows everything going on. If they start plotting to kill me, he's going to know who's doing the plotting and God rest their souls, as they would say. Now, does he do those kind of things? He tells me no. I don't believe him personally. I know him too well. He's too mean. Me? That's what I said. He's too mean for me. I can't do this. You need to leave. I want to. I better be dead than dead. I'm tired of hurt. tired of pain. This is my whole life of pain. Why? How can I not have the testimony you need for Isaiah 53? I said, as far as I'm concerned, I had paid up, so to speak, when I was gut shot and given cancer. I said, that's enough. He said, now I've got to change your emotions how to do it. I'm God. And he said that all the time. Keith, I am God. I think I've told this story once before. They let me tell this one. By and large, I don't, I don't talk about what all he, he has done to me. But he lets me hear this one. Uh, so we, we've been arguing, and this is in my early days when I really was belligerent. And, and he... Belligerent. My, I was bitter, and my spirit was furious. And all of a sudden, God got mad, or at least he made it sound like he was mad. He said, Keith, I am God. And I said, God, I am Keith. <laughs> That's the last time I ever did that. He slammed me down to the ground. This invisible force just took my body and went, boom. I had to be quiet, my parents were asleep. Boom. And I mean, it's like falling out of a second story window. And you know, it's even worse. It's, it's just a powerful force that just slams you. It's not falling down on the ground. And you know, it just about knocks you too. And he's done that to me on scene and snapped and busted my chin and cracked my skull. I said, well, you know, what's wrong with you? And he says, nothing. Nothing's wrong with me. I'm God. I have a purpose in these things. I said, you got a purpose smashing my face in the slam in. He said, I do. Boy, I mean, what do you do? You can't do anything. <laughs> I can't believe it. Let me tell you about the slam in. Oh, it doesn't end there, people. It doesn't. It includes broken bones, too. Outside of the head. 